So let's just pick up um, where you, we just started there because I've had a lot of digestive issues too. So let's walk through this a little. What's worked for you? We'll share. We'll share. <laughs> so exciting. Yeah. Okay. So this is. It's like weird that you get so excited about that, right? Oh but God. it's like, man, when you've, we've dealt with it, you yeah. know that it's like, yeah. Well, and this is a pretty interesting story. I'm going to do my best to make it as short as possible, okay. which is hard for me. I, I was the girl <laughs> in sixth grade that always got in trouble for too much talking, okay. um, which is a good thing. So um, I have battled depression my entire life. And the majority of my adult life, I was on and off antidepressants. Um, and I always knew that I knew I had these symptoms of depression, mm -hmm. but I wasn't a, a traditional emotional depression, right? Um, it was more biological. I had these physiological symptoms, like it, always exhausted, couldn't get out of bed, hmm. way too dependent on coffee, digestive disorders, brain fog, couldn't think straight, like good days, bad days, yeah. a lot more physical symptoms, okay. a lot less emotional. So, And this is all through your 20s, 30s? My whole life, yeah. Okay. I was wow. a disaster in my 20s. And then through, you know, various strategies, uh, every year after my 20s, I would get better, 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 better. So I removed gluten. Um, and then I just started eating better in general. And then I started training differently. And then I started mindset strategies. Mm -hmm. So every year I would adopt some new strategies and I got better, better, better. But all okay. along... Um, I knew there was this conversation around, I was on antidepressants um, and I didn't want to be, and I knew that like I needed to address that. So I went to Date with Destiny with Tony Robbins. Mm -hmm. I don't know, are you familiar with that program? Yeah. That's the one that's like a week long boot camp. I okay. mean, he really beats the crap out of you. And out of that, I came and I, he, you know, really passionately believes that we don't need to be on antidepressants. Mm. And I was that person that was on antidepressants and still depressed, <laughs> which right, doesn't right, make any sense, right. right? So I came back from that and I was like, I want to start the process of weaning myself off. One of them I had been on for 14 years wow. and all of my advisors and doctors were like, you know, you might not be able to do this because you've been on it for so long. Mm. So I took a period of time, about two years, to wean myself down and off. And at each stage of the weaning, mm -hmm. as I brought myself down in dosage, I started getting allergies, which I had never had before. So I started getting these symptoms of allergies so that when I fully stepped off the antidepressants, it was full-blown. I could not conduct myself. My allergies oh, were so man. bad, right? And I knew there was a correlation. So once again, I sought the help of a functional nutritionist and a couple of different advisors and doctors. And we discovered that there were actually a lot of digestive gut biome issues at play. Yeah. As soon as I took out dairy and grains, my allergies were gone in two wow. weeks. Two weeks, gone. Crazy. And all of those symptoms of depression that I had been calling depression. Yeah were actually grains and dairy. That is crazy. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So literally, it was like a crisis moment because yeah. I was so happy to find out that it was so simple as my body doesn't like grains and dairy, yeah. right? Because I, I haven't turned that into a no one should eat grains or dairy. My body has a digestive injury and grains and dairy were very problematic. Yeah. So I was happy to find it, but I also was like, oh, I battled this my whole life and I didn't know. It's like right. I suffered. You know, my life was so compromised my entire life because I was eating grains and dairy. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we want to go there, but also chicken. I really, um, I'm, I'm a big believer in eating according to your blood type. Mm -hmm. And um, when I started eating according to my blood type, that was something that really shifted majorly for me. So I took chicken out and I took dairy and grains out and I'm like a completely different person. That's crazy. Totally it's different It's crazy person. how many people aren't aware of that and how many people have a similar story. I know. Now being on all that medication had to have banged up your digestive system too though, Probably, right? yeah. yeah. And yeah. maybe that, you know, I don't know. Yeah. I know that when I was a kid, I had I had very clear and obvious signs that I should not be eating dairy. Mm. So I knew it as a kid. So that leads me to think that I probably had some digestive issues going back to then. Um, but yeah, I mean, I have to imagine also years of just like serious abuse of coffee. Yeah, could not be good for my digestive system. Yeah. And yeah, and I think. Um, you know, in terms of the whole antidepressant brain medication conversation, I think that 
Um, I needed them when I was put on them, and in some ways it saved my life. And yeah, they're incredibly toxic. They're incredibly damaging on your system. And so the way it was described to me, which made a lot of sense, is as soon as I took off as soon as I took off the tamper of the antidepressants and I was no longer suppressed in many ways, it was like everything came up and out, mm-hmm. as well as all the emotions, mm-hmm. right? But it was like, oh, now we've taken off this damper that the antidepressants do for you so that I was able to see all of the effects of how I was eating and living. And, you know, it's like my, I have a degree in exercise physiology and nutrition. And so, like, I have a strong nutrition background. And, like, I just never really even thought, like, oats and organic egg whites and eggs could yeah. be a problem. Like, yeah. it just it, – it, I missed that. I missed that lecture. Right. You know what I mean? Somehow. And it was like, again, I don't, I don't, I don't in any way, um, I don't demonize grains and dairy for other people because I see other people thrive on them. But I know for me that they were like, they were absolutely 100% the root and the cause of a lot of my symptoms of depression. Yeah. And it's funny. I've noticed the same thing. Foods that I don't do well with, I'll get like anxiety or I'll get bummed out, especially the next day and sometimes even 48 hours later, like I'll be down and bummed out. What foods? I don't do well with oats at all. Yeah. I don't do well with eggs. I don't do well with dairy. Yeah. What's your blood type? Do you know? I don't even know actually. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, should, I should delve into that a little I'm deeper. I'm just curious. So, so, and then you mentioned chicken. What, what are yeah. some tests you believe? Like, you think people should do d- different food sensitivity tests and things like yeah. that? Yeah. So, I definitely think IgG testing is fantastic. I think um, all my clients go through it now. I, I set myself up as a practitioner with one of the labs, and so I run it on my clients, okay. especially if I'm suspecting mm-hmm. issues. Um, I will often work with people to see if we can get you in working order and doing re- really well just by like good basic advice. Yeah. And then if there still are some issues that we need to clear up, I'll do IgG testing. Um, so I think that's really important. There's a test called um, an OATS test, organic acids test, right. that is really, actually one of your guests recently yeah, was talking Dr. about Stephen that. Yeah, Dr. Cabral. Yes, that's who yeah. it was. I'm a huge fan of the OATS test. That yeah. was huge for me. Um, and And that's incredible because that also shows you like, the let's call it like the chemical byproducts of how caffeine is being is affecting you in your body right or are you getting um you know phthalates and problems and plastics and issues Mm. that are getting into your body so the oats test is incredible and then the chicken piece of the puzzle for me is that uh, when i was in my 30s and i was kind of working through some of the symptoms i was having I had a couple really specific symptoms that were really weird, which I'm happy to share with you about. And at the time, I was working on a book with a medical doctor who became a colleague and a friend. And she's also like just so gifted. I mean, I call her a witch doctor. She's a witch of sorts. She's so talented and so gifted. And she and I were talking one day while we were working on the book, and I was telling her about these symptoms. And she's like, you're a B blood type. Are you eating chicken? And I was like, yeah. And she's like, take the chicken out. And sure enough, all I did was take chicken out. And three months later, those symptoms were gone. Wow. I mean, 100% gone. And and I'm a pretty sane person, you know, because I also was like, am I imagining this? (laughs) Is this placebo effect? Like, right? Am I making this up? But it was so legitimate for me. So she obviously believes in eating according to your blood type. Yep. I did some research. It resonated with me. I started playing around with the concept for myself. And if we go with this philosophy, which I very much believe in, if you go with the philosophy of eating according to your blood type, each of the four blood types has a couple foods that are particularly problematic. Mm -hmm. Chicken for B blood types is really problematic. It's super, super toxic for a B blood type. Whereas dairy for an O mm -hmm. and grains for an O, you're probably an O. That's going to be my my guess for you. Um, is toxic. So I took the chicken out, you know, which I had been eating. I don't know where you are in the chicken thing, but I mean, I was eating chicken three times a day. It was my yeah. meat, you know? Well, I, I do feel a hundred times better if I eat red meat versus chicken. Yeah. Like I have great energy, yeah. great digestion. If I eat chicken, sometimes I get tired a little yeah. bit. So, um, where was I going to go with that? 
I just completely We're talking about different. chicken, and you said what tests and food sensitivity. And oh, so what would be some of the, like, if someone eats chicken, what would be some of the symptoms that they might notice? Well, the thing is, it's it depends on your um, genetic markers. And yeah, so, so if it's a food you don't tolerate, what well, maybe everybody's you feel different. tired. Everybody's different, but okay. what, yeah. yes, absolutely. So I think the ones that I see with my clients um, are fatigue, for sure, mm. brain fog, for sure, distended belly, bloating, gas. Mm. Um, irregularity in the bathroom, whatever that may look like, right? Um, But, you know, I'll talk about, because I think it's also really interesting to look at how unique the symptoms can get. And with my clients, what I ask is I say, do you have any, like, nagging things about your biology that you think are quirky or weird and bothersome? Yeah. And when you start to look at the things that are, like, quirky and weird – a lot of times those aren't normal things that we're supposed to be experiencing and it's probably fallout from something else. So for me, it was really interesting because I was just a metabolic disaster in my 20s. I think I was an emotional disaster in my 20s too. <laughs> probably most people were. Oh my gosh, I was a disaster. I look back and I'm like, whoa. Yeah. Um, so uh, um, starting in my 20s, I was working with a doctor and discovered that I had reactive hypoglycemia which didn't make any sense. And I was syndrome X, which is the precursor that looks like the person's going to become diabetic, Mm -hmm. right? And I was really healthy. I was a trainer. I was super fit. I was eating how we're supposed to be eating, right? And um, But yet I had this really unstable blood sugar. Um, I couldn't recover from my workouts. Even little leg days, I'd be sore for four days. I just had no power. You know when you go up a flight of stairs and Mm -hmm. your legs can feel like lead? I felt like that all the time. Oh, man. And I lived in New York, so going up and down the subway stairs, running around the city, you know, it was like every time there was a flight of the stairs, I'd literally have to be like, I can do this, and climb a flight of stairs, right? Because my legs were just sludge. Yeah. Just 24-7? All the time. Wow. Unless I was super caffeinated. If I had okay. just like really cracked out on yeah. on like some Starbucks, I yeah. could like fly up those subway stairs, you know. Um, but most of the time, yeah, I felt that. And I thought, I guess this is just me. I guess this is just one of those quirks in my physiology. I guess, I don't know, uh, that's just me. So that was, that was one of the symptoms that then in my 30s um, we looked back upon and was one of the symptoms that I told this doctor about, um, along with the unstable blood sugar. So in a B, and for a lot of people, and, and I know you know this, when we're looking at uh, gut biome and gut health, a lot of times unstable blood sugar isn't your protein and your carbohydrate balance. It's actually digestive issues playing out, destabilizing your blood sugar. And so for me, I had all of these symptoms that come with unstable blood sugar. But it wasn't, you know, I was actually doing the zone at the time. So I was really strictly 40, 30, 30. Mm -hmm. My blood sugar should have been stabilized, but yet I was still having these destabilizing effects on my blood sugar. So that was one of them for me. And that was one of them. When I took chicken out, it was gone, gone, gone. And now I can fly up like any old flight of stairs. That like, one yeah. change. That's crazy. I swear to God. Wow. Yeah. And I know that sounds like I tend to be, I mean, I really geek out on philosophies and strategies and I've always been that way. So when I was in my thirties, I, I had been, you know, following the, the protocol at the time for eating, whatever it was, you know, and I was eating basically the same thing all the time. Mm-hmm. And so my diet was very consistent, super duper consistent. Yeah. So I took out the chicken and I literally changed nothing else. And three months later, I noticed a difference. Six months later, I noticed a massive difference. And now five, eight years later, I eat chicken maybe once a month. Okay. You know, like if it's an airport at 11 o'clock at night and I'm in the middle of Detroit and there's nothing to eat, yeah. I'm starving, I'll eat chicken if I yeah. have to. Um, but now it's like my recovery from workouts is different. I My blood sugar is so rock solid, assuming I eat right. Um, and what does that look like for you nowadays? What's eating right nowadays? Yeah. So these days I'm dairy and gluten free. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm clearing up some digestive issues, I, I have to keep an eye on how much protein I eat. I'm a huge believer in eating according to macros. I had genetic testing done and I I am someone who actually needs a very high amount of carbohydrates okay. to function optimally 
and to stay lean, mm. believe it or not. And so this was another test I did last year when I was discovering everything that I shared with you. I did so much testing last year. Um, but I discovered that I had been doing about a 35-35-30 breakdown of macronutrients, so about the same amount of protein mm -hmm. as carbs. So I was getting like 35% protein, and sometimes a little less. No, sometimes a little bit more. Um, and when I got my genetic testing done, what I found out is that my body actually does so much better on up to 65% carbohydrates. So I've now shifted my macros where I eat like, 50, 25, 25, but actually more like 50, 20, 30. Okay. I bring my protein down to about 20%. And gotcha. so um, I'm and really- you feel great doing that. I, it's when I stick to it. So for me, it's a combination of getting my macronutrients right, mm -hmm. but it's also a function of um, getting my calories right because I have a tendency to not get enough calories. So macronutrients have to be right, but then obviously- Food chemistry is big inside of yeah. my body. I have to stay away from dairy. I have to stay away from grains. I got to yeah. be really careful with alcohol. Um, so I eat a lot of vegetables. I eat a lot of potatoes and sweet okay. potatoes, like a shocking amount of potatoes and sweet yeah. potatoes. A shocking amount. I mean, like, like four or five whole potatoes okay. every single day. And then my protein is, um, you know, wild fish. Mm -hmm. I do some beef. I do bison. Lamb is really great for me. Turkey, uh, no egg whites, and then just a ton of vegetables, some fruit for sure. But I, I mean, I guess somebody could look at it and call it a paleo diet. I don't yeah. like to ascribe it that way. Right. I really just, I don't, I don't, you know, the only thing I can't do is da grains and dairy. Yeah. And as long as I stay away from that and I get enough carbohydrate, I'm like Wonder Woman. I mean, yeah. it's, I'm able to get lean better than I've ever been able mm. to, I'm able to put muscle on better than ever from more carbohydrates and less protein. Yeah, I, I love when females share that because so many people, males and females, are terrified of carbs. Yeah. And a lot of times, once you put carbs in someone's diet who's been on low carbs for a long time, they feel way better, their hormones change, their sex yeah. drive goes up, and they get lean for the first time. Yeah, check, 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 check. Yeah, for not real. that low carbs doesn't work for some people sometimes, Correct. for sure it does, totally. but I remember, I tried every variation of low carbs forever. I never got visible abs till I was 40, and that was from yeah. going high carb and low fat finally. Totally. Totally. And not like dangerously low fat, but like 20% or whatever it was. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, for me, it was like, I mean, I like, no joke. A couple months ago, I woke up, rolled out of bed and I'm like, I'm good today. <laughs> and I like looked in the mirror and I'm like, I have the body at 46 that I wanted my entire life. Right. And I'm like, and even the people in my life are like, you look better than ever. And I'm like, 65% carbohydrates. <laughs> I'm eating potatoes every day. Yeah. You know? And so I agree. Like, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding, especially because of the emergence of keto, which, by the mm. way, really is just act Atkins yeah. repackaged, right? Yeah. It's not that keto is super duper innovative. Um, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding around it. And I think there's a lot of... People don't have enough time to really listen and understand it, and so they just glom on to it. But um, in my practice with my clients, I will work with a woman who comes to me terrified of carbs. Mm. I'll work with her. But we ultimately end up gradually introducing carbs, and every single time, no matter how old she is, no matter what her fitness level is, she comes back to me and she's like, wow, mm. I feel so much better. My sex drive is better. I'm leaner. My workouts are better. I'm yeah. able to put muscle on. And I'm going to say it again, I feel better. I yeah. mean, the fastest way for me to feel like shit is to not get enough carbohydrates. I mean, I'm a disaster. If I'm a disaster at five in the afternoon, I know it's because I didn't have enough carbs earlier in the day. Every single time I eat some carbs and I'm like, I'm back. Right. I'm happy again. Yeah, totally happy. Yeah, that's true too. Cause like I'll get I'll get anxiety and stressed out and my mood will be worse if I don't have enough carbs throughout the day as well. Yeah. Like by midday I'm I'm super stressed out. But if yeah. I have carbs, totally different story. And then you see, like you, you said with your clients, you hear a lot of people who are doing CrossFit and so they go super low carbs because they'd be paleo and they're demolished and then you put them on carbs and they and they instantly yeah. feel better. And the thing is too, what what a lot of people don't understand, I think, is it's easier to hit your macros and eat less calories when it's lower fat and higher carbs. Like you can eat a ton of calories if you're just eating high fat. Like mm -hmm. you could hit your calories for the day by breakfast if yeah. you're just eating bacon, eggs, and avocado, like yeah. putting butter in your coffee. Yeah. It's it's easier to to not eat so much. Yeah. Totally. Because yeah. the food volume. Like if you're totally. eating a lot of potatoes, like try to get fat eating sweet potatoes. Eat as many as you want. You exactly. can't eat that many. You <laughs> exactly. know what I mean? Like you'll be stuffed. Totally. Like I did a, a 34-day paleo AIP. And yeah. I had some symptoms that went away within two weeks, but I was still eating 
minimum four sweet potatoes a day and like two cups of fruit. So I was still eating a yep. lot of carbs. Okay. So that's where your carbs were coming from. Yeah. That's the hardest thing for me. Like, yeah, because everyone, my, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but yeah. so many people online were like, oh, so you're going super low carb. And I was like, no, dude, I'm at like t- at least 200 grams of carbs a day on, yep. on low days for me. Cause I was eating huge sweet potatoes and, 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 uh, and fruit. Yeah. 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 I know. And, and I think that's also part of it. People are, people like to have this definition of low carb, high carb. And I'm like, well, let's define, define it. And people forget that I've had clients say I ate half of a sweet potato. I ate tons of carbs. And I'm like, but it's a percentage of your total calories in the day. Yeah. You might still be dangerously low on your carbs, even though you ate a half of a sweet potato. Mm-hmm. Like as a percentage of that whole day, that's not high carbs. Right. And I think people think I ate a bowl of oatmeal. I'm eating a ton of carbs. Yeah. Doesn't matter if you're eating a ton of protein also. Yeah. And, and a bowl of oatmeal, if you could tolerate it, is like depending on how much. Like a, a decent sized bowl of oatmeal for me is like 30 grams of carbs. Yeah. Like that's not a lot of carbs. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So let, let's go back a little bit to uh, how you got your start in, in fitness. Um, you, we were talking earlier about how when you graduated school and you moved into the city. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So, um, oh gosh, where to start? So I, when I was growing up, I grew up in a very like middle class town in Pennsylvania and had no aspirations for life. And my mom always just put this pressure on me. What are you going to be when you grow up? And I'm like, I didn't like anything except exercise. Okay. And so, uh, My career in fitness has always been really just like following my bliss for real. I mean, Mm. I just have loved everything about health and fitness. And so uh, when I graduated Penn State with the degree in exercise physiology and nutrition, um, you know, as I I was telling you earlier, like I wanted to conquer the biggest city around. And so I went to New York City. And at the time, there was an institute opening by the name of Center for Preventative Medicine, Pat Menachia, who... um, Pat Menachie is actually credited. He's the guy that got Madonna into her shape in the 80s and 90s. Remember when she got like really ripped? Pat Menachie did that for her. He still trains Howard Stern. He's really, he's the trainer behind a lot of incredible people and bodies. And so he was opening this really cool place in New York City. And I got a job there as like one of three trainers, the only female trainer when they opened. And that's where I started. And how'd you end up landing that? Oh, this is crazy. So this is really crazy. Um, I went to Penn State, Mm -hmm. and they're very heavy on exercise physiology, and Mm -hmm. they wanted you to go into the medical world. So I, when I graduated Penn State, I went to Michigan and did an internship in cardiac rehabilitation because they were really pushing us to do cardiac rehab. Mm -hmm. So I was working at a hospital in Michigan, miserable, um, doing cardiac rehab. And I knew I was miserable, and I was flipping through a Vanity Fair magazine, right? And there was a a story on Pat Menachia opening this place. And I was like, his angle was like they were taking fitness and bringing a medical aspect to fitness. So it's a gym, but they were doing like EKG max tests and um, all kinds of like advanced medical tests that I knew I would be able to conduct because I had been working in hospital, right? So I was like, this guy needs to hire me. I had so much bravado in my 20s. I wish I still had it. Gosh. Um, but I was like, he needs someone like me. And I literally picked up the phone and I'm like, I'm Holly Perkins and I have a degree in exercise physiology and nutrition. You need a trainer like me. And he's like, come on in, let's, let's interview. And it was just like destiny. It was divine meeting. And you know, he still is my mentor and a dear friend. And so I moved to New York and I worked there for, I think I worked there for four years and got to train like, like the most A list of the most A list. I mean, every single time someone walked in the door. It was just like shocking who was coming in that place. And um, so I started there as a trainer. And um, pretty quickly, I was just like, I kind of need to do my own thing. And I left and I... But the experience there was great? Yeah. 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 um, Yes. A, he is, was my mentor and taught me so much about strength training. That's really where I laid my foundation of programming for strength training for people. And I think I probably wouldn't have gotten that elsewhere. I think a lot of female trainers don't get that. Right. So I was lucky in that, you know, Strength training was the foundation of everything for him. We had a lot of professional athletes that came in there. We trained 30 to 40 people for the New York City Marathon every year. Mm -hmm. Strength training was always your foundation. It's what allows you to do everything else. And so that's really where I developed my philosophies as a trainer, um, which I still very much believe in and have worked for me all these years. 
And uh, so, yeah, I mean, it was really, it was great. And I just think by nature, I kind of fly a little solo. And so when I left there, I was like, I just need to kind of work for myself. And so I was like a private trainer in New York for a long time. You know, let's call it another six years. All right. Did then you I got, go to people's buildings or did you work at a gym or yep, something? Nope. Okay. I went from apartment to apartment. Okay. Yeah. I just always was like running around the city and training people in different places. And sometimes yeah. I'd see people in Central Park, but I wasn't working at one specific gym, okay. which as you can imagine was exhausting. Yeah. Um, so after 10 years of that, I was just like exhausted. And uh, now, Holly, back then, how much... Yeah. Uh, reading, studying about business were you doing or were you just having a success? None. You just had a successful business just based on your personality and your training skills. And I just loved, like I loved what I did. And by the way, um, you know, like I don't say this to brag in any way, but like I trained Howard Stern and Natasha Richardson and Liam Neeson and like incredible, incredible people. Like that just opens up a lot of doors without me even trying. And so my personal training business really grew very naturally just because I had those associations. Like I was really fortunate to get to work with an incredible group of people Mm. and all of the um, other people on the outskirts of that, of that family that was there. And so, no, I just, I literally, I didn't get the business bug until four years ago. I mean, literally I've just been like blissing my way through my career until four years (laughs) ago. And four years ago I was like, I want to, I want to do something, you know? Um, Real quick, how how was training Howard? Oh, he's like so amazing. He's, he's one of my favorite people still. Okay. Um, he's lovely. He's funny. He's sensitive. He's sweet. Yeah. He's personal. Like he's everything you wouldn't expect him to be. Mm. I mean, he's very caring and warm and, hilarious and like yeah just like one of my absolute favorite people we and you know I got to train him and we spent time together like hanging out and like you know we became friends that's so cool and uh, I've listened to Howard since 1987 yeah huge fan so yeah Yeah. so you might remember then when he went through his phase when um he was separating from his first wife Mm -hmm. and he started getting a bunch of tattoos Mm -hmm. so I have a tattoo that I went and I got with him when he got his own symbol on his pinky it was his second tattoo he got that one I got this one and then he went on to get all his other tattoos you know and he was going through like that phase yeah is that the Um, only one you have I only have one yeah and I got that one with him wow and uh yeah, so he's he's like, he's really, really, um, you know, this is the thing I notice about people who are really like, you know, um, A-list celebrities, let's call it, right? Because most of them are legitimately artists of various sorts. Mm-hmm. And they're really unusual, incredible people often I have found. Mm-hmm. Um, and so my experience with a lot of the celebrities that I've worked with, they've all been like, really cool good people you know they think differently they behave differently right um you know they've got talents that are really unusual and different than other people and uh so yeah so my experience with him like i just i don't think i could speak highly enough of him honestly wow yeah and he has really sexy feet like (laughs) sexy feet sexy feet like i got i got nervous when i saw his feet one time i was like oh okay (laughs) i didn't know i liked feet okay (laughs) Oh, okay. <laughs> He's a good guy. And then yeah. so so how, how does your business progress from there then? So you're you're in New York for another 6 yeah. years training people. Yeah, and then I got the bug to come to Los Angeles, which I did. Mm-hmm. Um and then two things happened when I got to Los Angeles, which I really do credit, you know, spirit or some other more powerful source out there in the universe than me. Two things landed in my lap. A, I got a phone call from Exercise TV, which mm-hmm. is now gone. Um it was one of, it was like there were two channels that were on cable television that were running exercise DVDs 24 mm-hmm. 7. Do you remember that? Exercise TV yeah, was one of them, yeah. and then there was another one. Okay. I forget the other one. I don't remember the other one, but there were two of them that were running. Um, I guess that would be in the 90s, right? No, wait, no, 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 early 2000s. Yeah, early 2000s. So I got a phone call from Exercise TV, and they wanted me to create some fitness DVDs. And so I started doing a bunch of fitness DVDs with um, Exercise TV in mm-hmm. the early 2000s. And um, A, created the workouts and also, quote unquote, starred in them. But then I also started producing on the behind the scenes for other people, some other like noteworthy DVD celebrities that I don't want to mention, but basically I created the curriculum behind their DVDs. They showed up and filmed them. Gotcha. So I was, you know, doing the kind of workout and programming for some of these popular fitness DVDs. 
And then at the same time, I um, got this incredible ambassadorship with New Balance. So I was with New Balance for seven years Mm. um, as their one and only fitness ambassador. And so those two things really started to kind of shift how I, I, I wanted to grow my reach and grow the way that I shared my love of fitness with people yeah. beyond being a one-on-one trainer in the gym. Okay. And then a few years later, I got a phone call and once again, I uh, literally a book deal landed in my lap unbeknownst to me to write Lift to Get Lean with Women's Health. And uh, when that landed in my lap and I realized it was like a real legitimate book and I had no skills as a writer, I was like, how am I going to do this? And they were like, you have to write this book in two months. And I was like, two months. how am I going to do that? That's impossible, right? Yeah. And so I was like, well, I like a challenge. Let me see if I can do it. And um, I literally showed up on a Tuesday. This probably goes back four years now, maybe five years, probably four years. I showed up on a Tuesday to train, you know, my clients in the gym here in LA. I had maybe five or six clients booked that day. And I showed up and I was like, I'm done. I'm done training clients. I'm on hiatus. I got to go write this book. Huh. And so I took a break from one-on-one personal training, wrote the book, liked that change in my lifestyle, and then started building a new way of doing business, which uh, is now virtual. Okay. So wait, so so let me backtrack for a second. You have a successful business in New York. That's got to be a huge risk to leave that and come here. So what was kind of that decision-making process? Like, why did you want to leave that? Was it scary leaving that? Yeah. And what did you envision coming out here? Why did you want to come out here? Yeah, it it was terrifying and it made no sense and it was completely illogical. I literally picked up and was like, I'm going to LA. Okay. Didn't know a single person out here. Okay. And I was just like, I knew that I needed to do it. And, you know, as I said to you earlier, I was really unhappy Mm. those last few years in New York and I knew I just needed to leave. Yeah. And so illogically, without a game plan, which I don't recommend that for anybody, I leapt hoping the net would appear. Yeah. And it did eventually, but it was a very stressful phase. I literally picked up and moved to LA and didn't know anybody. But like I said to you, you know, I don't um I don't love training celebrities. But it does open doors. Sure. And so as soon as I got out here, I got phone calls and opportunities yeah. to train okay. people. And okay. so as soon as I got out here, I did start training people and that was how I paid the bills uh-huh. until all of these other things started to blossom. And um, yeah, and the decision really was, I'm a huge risk taker, Mm -hmm. um, blind risk taker, which again, in some ways, like it got me to where I am and I love that about myself, but there was a lot of stress that goes with that, that I don't like to do anymore. I'm a lot more calculated now because I realize it just burns out my adrenals when I do that. So it was a bit naive maybe, but I was just like, I don't care. I'm going to go do it. Yeah. You know, and I want to go to L.A. and who cares if I lose all my clients and I have no clients out there. I have to go. It kind of felt like survival. Yeah. You know, so that, that's one of those things we have in common. Then I guess. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I mean. Yeah. So so, so so then you get the book deal and you're like, wow, I, I enjoy this lifestyle more so than training people all day. So so how does that progress? And, yeah. and, and, and you're not training people at all anymore or a few people? So I am. Okay. So I took about four years and. I think I just needed a change. Yeah. And I think I just needed a challenge. Okay. So I was like, how can I grow my business um, outside of the gym, mm-hmm. outside of person to person work? And I built up a whole virtual practice, which mm-hmm. I'm happy to talk about. Four years of being behind my computer and building up a virtual practice, mm-hmm. I was like, I'm <laughs> isolated and I need people. Right. So I went yeah. back to training yeah, people. So now I'm training people because okay. I realize like I really do love it. Yeah. And I think yeah, sometimes imp- you just need to step away a little. And I also think like if I'm going to be if I, I get really frustrated in our world of fitness personalities mm-hmm. who have huge Instagram accounts and followers, but they've never trained another human being. Right. Yeah, it's crazy. And I personally feel like an only way I can give you advice or someone else is because I've trained someone like you before. Sure. I think personally it's important that trainers are staying in the gym yep. and they're coaching and they're training. Yeah. And so I realized that. So now what I do is I have um, just a, a few select VIP clients that I love and adore and I just picked up the phones and I was like, I'll take clients, but it's got to be my way. Mm -hmm. And I've become a lot more, the client has to align with my philosophies in the gym. They've got to play my game in the gym. And if they do, I get incredible results with my clients now and I love it. And it, I love, I mean, I don't know why I love being in a gym. I walk Mm -hmm. in a gym and I feel like I'm like a little kid in a playground. Mm -hmm. I just 
I light up. And so. So how long has it been that you've been back training people now? A couple of years? Two years. Okay. Yeah. One or two years. Mm, yeah. Probably maybe a year and a half ish. Okay. I mean the time. Just and do you go to one of those them. trainer only gyms over yeah, there? Okay. I yeah. do. So yeah. mid city, I have a, tr- a, a, a no frills. Yeah. Non Hollywood, non scene, no attitude gym that I go to okay. in uh, mid city that nice. I really love. Cause yeah. it's just like, you can go in and do your thing and there's no attitude and there's no, yeah. you know, you know what I'm talking about. And like the whole, just like trainer vibe. Um, and so I'll have my clients come there and I'm probably, I bet I'm there. My sessions are long with my clients now. Like sometimes they're like an hour and a half, two hours. Sometimes, um, I'll probably have eight to 10 clients a week, client okay. sessions a yeah. week, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, it, it's just enough that I love it right? and I'm excited and I'm a hundred percent there, yep. but it's also not so much that it fatigues me mm-hmm. because I don't like to, you know, I, yeah. Training people when you do it well yep. is a hundred percent focus and it, it can be exhausting and it mm-hmm. should be exhausting i think if you're really doing it well yeah totally 100 percent. Right? it's so funny everything you're saying is everything that i tell the guys who are in my mastermind i would tell listeners who run a fitness business is first of all only take on clients that you're really excited to spend time yeah. with like would you hang out on the weekends with this person yeah would you do it for free are they like you yeah like it's got to be that person yeah. otherwise it's just going to drain you because oh. it is draining yes um and then you can create a business that you're really excited about. Don't burn yourself out. Like 40 sessions a week. I get it at the beginning if you have to grind. But eventually, like, start to say no. And, and then you can create a lifestyle that's so much better. And, and so many of the guys that, I, that I've coached, they've, they've doubled or tripled their income doing that. They're yeah. so much happier. Yeah. And you can charge more. That's Because exactly. you're better. Yeah. And they know that. Here's the thing. And you should always strive to charge more because then you can pro- provide a better service. And you yeah. can just do all these things that will build, you know, customer loyalty, brand advocacy. Yep. Like this is a person who's going to stick with you forever. 100%. If you're charging 40 bucks an hour, it's hard to do all the things outside of the gym and the stuff that makes them feel special and all that, yeah. you know? I so agree. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And here's the thing. Humans are are really perceptive. Mm-hmm. Your client knows if you're really in it or not. Yeah. And they want to think you really care about them. Yeah. Whether you do or not is is yours to, to work through. Yeah. But they're testing you like a dog yeah. to see <laughs> yeah. if you really legitimately care about them. And yeah. what I have found is I want to provide that care because I do. But I also know I'm happier giving you my care if I'm happy with my paycheck. Mm-hmm. And so I'm charging, right. I think, shocking uh, uh, shocking amount mm-hmm. these days. But my clients, liter- they'll pay it happily because they know that I'm there for them. Yeah. I mean, if they text me, you know, I have, I have boundaries and parameters, sure. but like they know they have access to me. Yeah. Yeah, I love it. So t- tell me a little bit more about your online business and how, how you yeah. started doing that Uh like after the book and then whatnot. Yeah. So um, I knew that I wanted to have some form of a, a virtual coaching process or program. Mm-hmm. And the way that it started was I literally just started communicating that, hey, I'm coaching people virtually. It doesn't matter where you live. I'm doing private one-on-one coaching. Yeah. And so what it started wa- as was just one-on-one coaching. People would call me from Australia. I have a lot of clients in Australia, oddly. Okay. But, you know, they call and they're like, I want to coach with you virtually. Mm-hmm. So I created a system of being able to coach people online okay. that's not platform based. Mm-hmm. Right. So I send documents. We do phone calls. I'm mm-hmm. happy to share the details of it. But um, so it started with one on one coaching. And this is actually very interesting. Um I have a client here in L.A. that's kind of like family that I have now known her for about 10 years. So I trained her for several years before I took a hiatus. And she's one of the clients that I brought back on to my practice. I used to see her six days a week. And when I started doing virtual coaching with people in Australia or DC or Dallas, I was noticing that I was actually getting better results with my clients virtually Hmm. than I was with my clients that I was seeing six hours a week or more, right? And um, so as soon as I saw that, like, my success as a coach was different than what I thought it was, and I was able to really, like, get incredible results with, for people wherever they are, I wanted to grow that more. Yeah. So from one-on-one coaching, what I've now done is I'm creating group coaching programs okay. that are all online. 
Um, the hub is Facebook. I create mm-hmm. private groups where that can be their hub for activity. <clears throat> and then I created 200 or so video tutorials that are on YouTube. And I write up exercise programs and I send it to people in an electronic format. And then they've got their video tutorials to follow. And I have a whole system nice. for like how I yeah. help them to do it, mm-hmm. you know? And it really like, I'm kind of shocked how effective <laughs> it is, yeah. right? But yeah. like, when the person's willing to listen to you and take action on what you tell them to do, I have a rule with all my clients, and I say it kind of sternly. I say, if you do what I tell you to do, you're going to get awesome results. Mm-hmm. The problem is if you don't actually do what I tell you to do. And that sounds a bit bossy, but the truth is, if I'm writing up a nutrition plan and a cardio plan and a strength training plan that has certain variables and mathematics to it, let's call it. Mm-hmm. I know this is going to work for you, yeah. right? But you got to do it. And so that's the biggest thing. So I know that like, I think I've gotten good at knowing what the programming should look like based on a person's goals. And then now I'm getting better at helping people to actually execute on it, you know? And, and you know, I know you work more with men. I work more with women. Mm-hmm. I wonder if there's a difference there. Like one of my biggest challenges with women is like getting them to do what they're supposed to do. Really? Do you find that with men too or no? Not really. Yeah, I don't yeah. think so. The men that I've worked with, it's like I tell them to do it and they do it. Yeah. And I'm like, why don't women do this? <laughs> right. I don't get it. Women, women, it's it's a lot more complicated than here's your workout. Just do it. Yeah. Right? Which yeah. is more my mentality. I'm like, if I hired a coach for a lot of money and you told me to eat broccoli 18 times a day, mm-hmm. I would eat broccoli 18 yeah, times. Do I don't care if I hate broccoli. Right. You're the expert. If you're telling me to do it and I'm paying you, I'm going to do it. Not all women are that way. Okay. And so it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think I charge a pretty hefty price tag for my coaching now. Yeah. Even those people still sometimes don't do it. <laughs> right. <laughs> don't get it. Yeah. Right. I don't know. Maybe it's like a, a woman thing. Yeah. I don't know. But yeah. Okay. And then as the business grew, like how did you scale it more? How did you, like who do you have working with you now? What, is, what have been some of the challenges? Yeah. So the biggest challenge was, um, as I mentioned earlier, like I'm a solo flyer. I'm a perfectionist mm. and I do things really well and I know I do. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to give up that control. Yeah. And I had to start saying, okay, like I'm, I was drowning. And yep. so the biggest thing for me was bringing on, I have two assistants now, um, bringing them in and letting them do it not to my perfect standards. Are they virtual or are they here? They're real. Yeah. Okay. They, so and they you work see them person. all the time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. I like to have somebody here. Yeah. And so I'm, that's when you say there's always people at your place. That's yeah, what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. That's one of the reasons. Okay. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. There's always, I mean, my house has kind of become a we work space. Yeah. I mean, like, <laughs> okay. There's so much going on. And so like right now my best friend is there babysitting my dog and working. Okay. You know? So then when I go back, we'll co-work together. Yeah. And so it's just like every day somebody's coming around to co-work or hang out or my assistants are there. And um, so, yeah, the biggest challenge for me was relinquishing having to do everything on my own, which really came from a sense of like pride in the quality of the work that I do. Mm -hmm. And like, I, I really, really am like deeply grateful when I get a client and I want them to get the best of me. And I had this belief that the only way I could fully serve them was if I 100% fully served them. Yeah. Yep. So I had to give up some of that perfectionist ways and, and let my assistants do it their way, which is a little differently. They still do a great job. Yep. That. Um, and then in terms of scaling, um, I'm really just at the point right now where I'm truly beginning to scale. Okay. Um, And the way that I'm doing that, I created an online 12-week virtual coaching program. Mm -hmm. It's called The Comeback. The hub where we operate from is Facebook, totally free. Why is it called The Comeback? Uh, because the, whole, the the philosophy really is for, it's for women only, mm-hmm. but it really is. It's like, do you need a comeback? And mm-hmm. I mean, the deeper story is that after I went through the phase that I told you about where I had some medical issues, came off antidepressants, it was ugly for yeah. a period of time. It was real ugly. And I was beaten down. Yeah. This was maybe a year and a half, two years ago. Ish. The time is all so fuzzy, but... I was just beaten down, right? And I'd gotten out of shape because I felt like crap. Mm-hmm. I had, I was just just a mess. And um, I was upset and talking to a friend about it. And she's like, it's like you need a comeback. Mm. And she's like, why don't you create a comeback? And I was like, ding, 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 ding. So I wrote 
programming for myself. Okay. Nutrition, separate cardio, separate strength and conditioning, three separate programming variables that I was like, this is going to be my comeback. And that became the comeback. Mm. And so the angle for the participants is, do you need a comeback? Yeah. There are some women who just need to get somewhere. And I think the um, language around it still appeals to them as well. But it's 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 for that woman who like wants to 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 get to a new place, who wants to become that version that she wanted, you know, she's wanted to be, whether it's a comeback or whether she's doing it for the first time. Okay. And so, yeah. And um, so there too, I, I deliver to them a handbook. It's about a 54 page handbook that's got periodized strength training program for 12 weeks. Um, my approach to nutrition and then a personalized cardio program, which is based on their heart rate. So I have them do a whole little calculation, and it's all based on percentages for their cardio, their steady state, there's interval workouts. It's, it's, it's a good program design. So they're getting all of the programming and all the handbooks. And um, then there's video tutorials, so they know how to do a deadlift or they know how to do yeah. a goblet squat, right? And then every two weeks we have live group coaching phone calls. Oh, nice. So that is the thing that I'm, you know, from a business perspective, that's my opportunity to scale. Yeah. And so I'm laying the foundation now to legitimately scale it. Okay. <clears throat> it's been growing on its own just from my community, which is great. My email list, my social platform, it's been growing. Also, my testimonials have been incredible. Yeah. I mean, I'm shocked at how great the testimonials are. I've got four or five women that's like, they're in their late 40s and their 50s and they have kids and they've gone through menopause and like their progress photos are like, oh my God. Yeah, I've seen some. They're amazing. I mean, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And the women would report, and I had wine and I feel oh, wow. good yeah. and I'm eating more carbs than I've ever been eating. And it's like you and I would look at that and go, yes, 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 because right. that's how it's supposed to be right. when you get your programming right. Yeah. Um, so let's talk yeah. about that a little because you look amazing and you have had amazing transformations. Talk to me about your training. I mean, I know it's individual, but yeah. generally, how do you how do you train? And yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm a dude. I really think underneath it, it's like I train like a bodybuilder. Okay. I mean, I do four strength training workouts a week okay um in the past couple of months because of energy and i'm just refining some metabolism things i have been kind of shying away from cardio and mm -hmm. just leaning even more into my strength training workouts and like before i got my puppy and all hell broke loose <laughs> yeah. i was like looking amazing uh -huh. purely from strength training so i tend to so follow, what's, a, what's a week of training yeah. oh yeah what's a week so of training i do like? a four day split generally okay. i hit okay. legs twice per week for sure okay um if there's something going on with my my function or the um activation of any like my glutes or any of those like accessory muscle groups mm. i'll hit them more than twice per week but okay. i'm concertedly training legs twice a week and then i hit back and chest and shoulders and arms only once per week otherwise okay. sometimes i get lazy and i don't do arms um but i'll do like pretty high volume i mean if i'm doing a back day i'm getting like 28 to 30 sets Whoa. yeah i know it's a lot it's yeah. it's a lot but it feels great okay. and it, like i don't know why but my body thrives on volume and you're trying to go fairly heavy i, would I am yeah. i mean i'm eight to ten reps where like i've got excellent technique yeah but those last two reps are like i gotta dig deep in my yeah. soul to get through them not every set yeah um my physiology is definitely like my first few sets or my first few exercises actually my first few sets of any given exercise, I'm kind of ramping up. So mm -hmm. it's not until I get like three sets or four sets mm -hmm. that I really hit like a good intensity. Yeah. Then I switch exercise. So I tend to do straight sets with rest in between. Okay. Sometimes I'll superset, but my body really thrives on heavy weight, mm -hmm. low reps. That's mm -hmm. when I actually get my fibrillar hypertrophy. That's when my muscle changes and I don't just get pumped. Right. And so the past couple years, I really came to understand for women i don't know maybe it's my body um but you know the difference between hypertrophy and for me it's like i gotta make the muscle fibers bigger mm -hmm. if it's gonna legitimately change my body yeah and um so i you know i mean i go heavy by my standards i mean mm. I'm not doing heavy weight loads. It's not impressive at all. I mean, I, there have been times where I've done impressive weight loads. Right now, it's not. But that's the cool thing that I'm finding. Even if my deadlift is at 65 pounds or 85 pounds, it's shocking what it does for my body. I'm yeah. finding less is more for me yeah. if I really have um, quality workouts, right? That like 
if the intensity is there mm-hmm. and I'm I'm you know really getting enough volume to fatigue my system um, and my recovery is good four workouts a week I'm like I feel so 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 good okay um, yeah and, and then what about what about conditioning or cardio you said you don't tend to do as much I you know I do it because I know I need to do it mm-hmm. and I do feel well doing it um, steady state moderate intensity 70% cardio is really good for me um, I think part of it is because it just makes me feel good and mm-hmm. it's good for um, just sort of you know my my mind and my mood yeah right which people overlook and it's yeah. good for recovery it's exactly. good for exactly of... it's glycogen I mean and too many people just do hit and it's like Dude, you're already stressed out of your mind. Your exactly. cortisol is through the roof. Yeah. You're, tr- you're lifting hard four days a week. Exactly. Now in the other three days, you're going to do hit. You're yeah. going to be fried. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And I fry quickly. Yeah. So I think because my, my strength workouts are so taxing on my central nervous system mm. that if I'm then trying to do hit, I fry. Yeah, forget it. And so that's why I think less is more for me with the cardio as well. Steady state does wonders for me. Mm-hmm. So in a perfect week, I would do maybe two or three steady states, 35 minutes max. Otherwise, okay. it's two catabolic for me um and then if my energy's good uh, because i do battle energy a lot and i you know i've had some bouts mild bouts of depression and anxiety that i have to kind of lifestyle wise work through but if i'm good and i'm doing good then i'll do probably two interval workouts and i specifically use the word intervals and not hit training because and I really watch my heart rate. I cannot get above 90, 92% of my heart rate. And if I start to get up into that 95%, I fry so fast. Yeah. And um, so I aim for like 90% on my interval workouts. And even there, I'm going like two minutes at 90%. And that's it. Okay. Um, 25, 30 minutes. Like not, not lengthy training. Um, quality, I think, is really what's super important for right. me. But like, yeah, I mean, the less cardio I do, the better the results I get. Mm. Other than it does help me with recovery. It does help with stabilizing my blood sugar and muscle glycogen and feeling good and the sweating and beta oxidation and all of that. I think steady state's really important for yep. people. Uh, I don't use it for fat. I don't do not use it for fat loss, though. I mean, I do steady state for all those other reasons. Right. If I want to get ripped and take body fat off... It's nutrition and strength training. Totally, yeah, 100%. yeah. You could do zero cardio and yeah. get ripped. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah, especially coming from a female because yeah. they they get it twisted so often. No, I know, but yeah. but and I did that for years. But I think that was actually what I mean. If for the women listening, I think that's what was limiting my progress. Mm. Too much cardio. Mm-hmm. I used to run eight miles in Central Park as fast as I could. Right. As often as I could. Like, no wonder I was burnt out. My adrenals were fried. I had so many carbohydrate cravings, so many energy issues. I was constantly hungry, constantly wanting sugar. And my inflammation was up. And mm-hmm. I, I am absolutely certain it was limiting my progress. And for 9 out of 10 of the women that I work with, it's the same situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I have I to... I have that. to fight tooth and nail to get them to follow along with me. But when they do, they always agree. I mean, I've got so many written testimonials where they were like, wow, I'm doing a third of the cardio that I used to do, feeling better yeah. and getting much better results. Yep. I yeah. mean, it's shocking. So yeah. I did zero cardio for a year and I posted a picture on Instagram of uh, when, I, when I, was, I was fairly lean and had visible abs and serratus and everything. And I didn't recommend that. Like, I don't know, yeah. for whatever reason, I did zero cardio for a year and people couldn't believe it. I was like, no, it's really not that effective for mm-hmm. fat loss. Yeah. Like just what you just said, strength, yep. train and diet. Yeah. And sleep. Yes. If you're not sleep. sleeping. Yeah. And just stress management yeah. and inflammation management, yeah. right? Totally. Because inflammation is a whole other piece of it it's like when i took the grains and the dairy out i yep. just went bam and i'm right. like i don't do anything and i have great abs now yeah i mean i haven't done an ab exercise i don't do ab exercises really unless right. i'm putting up a video on instagram yeah. you know what i mean <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> i'll do an ab exercise yeah. but like yeah yeah what about recovery methods what are like do you do float tanks massage anything like that if i am uh if everything else in my programming is on point mm-hmm. and i can protect my sleep hygiene. Mm-hmm. I don't have to do a lot of other recovery efforts. Okay. Um, I love all cold exposure. Mm-hmm. Any form of cold exposure I think is brilliant and I will use it as often as I can. Um, I'm a huge fan of massage. Yoga is huge for recovery for me. How often do you do yoga? Um, at least twice a week. Okay. I, I got to commit to that. I've been saying that forever. 
It's yeah. real that that's a big one for recovery, but also for me, it's a shift in my mood and my right. mental outlook. Yeah. I mean, it just works on my brain and my mm-hmm. biochemistry very differently. Do you do hot yoga or any, anything specific? I'll do any kind of yoga. Okay. I love all you. I've been practicing yoga for 20 years and I love it, okay. but <clears throat> I tend not to do hot because I have this philosophy that I'm a redhead, I'm pale skinned. Mm-hmm. I don't do well with heat. Mm. And I think when I'm in a hot yoga class, the heat is an added variable. Yeah. I mean, that's an added stressor that sure. I find detracts from my workout. Okay. Because I'm so, I'm dealing with the environmental stress of the heat yeah. that I get less out of my work. So I don't love hot yoga. I don't mind warm yoga, but I tend to just do like a Hatha Vinyasa flow, moderate intensity. I don't okay. do aggressive. I don't do Ashtanga, even though I would love to be able to. Yeah. Um, mine tend to be more moderate because I do use it more for recovery. And for like feel good, you know, it's yeah. what keeps me in working order and keeps me really happy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, listen, deep, high quality sleep is really all you need. Yeah. Well, you're saying you're the, you're the master. You're all about that. So share some tips yeah. on how you, how you get awesome sleep. Caffeine management is yeah. a lot of it. Okay. Um, and I, I share this with people all the time. People don't realize, you know, the half life of caffeine. Do you know this is six hours? Mm-hmm. So that means that coffee that we just had at 11 a.m., mm-hmm. six hours later, half of it is still biologically active. Right. So if you're having a coffee at three in the afternoon, half of it is still metabolically active at 9 p.m. Yeah. And so I know caffeine is big for me. Um, I now cover my eyes with a mask because dark, 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 mm-hmm. cool is so important. Um, I've really cultivated a lot of mental strategies before I go to bed to clear my head. So I have a process when I get into bed that's sort of like a mantra that I do at the end of the day. Um, Sort of an intention setting to sleep deeply, to restore, to recover, to wake feeling refreshed. I mean, it's literally like a mantra. Um, And if I do, and obviously a great bed and great pillows, um, if I do all of that, it's like I sleep fantastic. It's the best I've slept in my entire life. I wake up feeling refreshed. Wow. And I really do think sleep is the thing that a lot of us can bring some strategy to. Yeah. Um, and that really is huge. I, it seems to me that for a lot of people, the problem with sleep is either caffeine, right? Mm-hmm. Or not enough exercise or too much exercise, but then also what your brain is doing. And so I think I've gotten really good at turning off my brain. And I also don't do That's hard to do. It's so hard to do. Um, I also try really hard not to have electronics in my room. Mm. I don't have a television in my room. I turn off my Wi-Fi at night. I try to put my cell phone charging someplace else so there's no technology in there. You know, sometimes I'll be on my Instagram in my bed at 10 o'clock at night, but I try really hard not to. Yeah. Um, I wear the glasses, the yellow glasses oh, do to you? reduce okay. blue light an hour before bed. Okay. I'm a huge fan of computer glasses, by the way. Yeah. Have you? Uh-uh. Worth looking into. Okay. Uh, especially if you're on your computer a lot during the day. I don't know to what degree you are, but. Not a ton. And there's there's okay. a point where I start to go insane and want to throw it out the window yeah. so I can't be on too long. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But is, is that is that all day or is it more if I'm on like after 5 p.m. or something? Both. 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 Okay. Yeah. I use my glasses all day when I'm okay. on the computer. I'm on my computer a lot. Yeah. Um, so I use them all day just to reduce that blue light and reduce the mm-hmm. eye strain. And then, yes, specifically like an hour or two before bed because it really does stimulate your brain. Right. Um, sure. And the other thing, if you get legitimate good computer glasses, mm-hmm. um, I just learned this, but, you know, because of the pixela- pixelation mm-hmm. of monitored screens, whether it's your computer or your phone. Yeah. Um, the pixels, our eyes can't focus on the pixels. Do you know this? Mm -mm. So they're little dots. They're actually Mm -hmm. little squares, Mm -hmm. really. So your eyes can't focus focus on anything that's using pixels. So when you're looking at a screen or your phone, your eyeballs are going back and forth trying to focus. That's why we get eye strain. Uh, Your eyes are going like this, trying to focus every time you look. And that's exhausting in your brain. It's not just eye strain. Your brain gets exhausted. Oh, totally, yeah. I'll get wiped out if I have to be at the computer too long. The glasses shift it so your eyes can focus. Gotcha. So they bring a focus so that you're not doing this anymore. You're focusing. And so it reduces. People talk about eye strain. It's actually yep. brain strain mm-hmm. is what it's doing. And I had a huge shift when I started mm. using proper computer glasses. How long have you been using them now? 
three years, four years now. Okay. Yeah. There's a brand that I really like. You know, I think there are a couple brands out there now. I just think it's important that you get a legit brand. Yeah. Because I think there's some of them that are only doing the um, the amber lenses, which block the blue light, but that's only one aspect of the technology. Yeah. The other aspect is this focusing consideration. Okay. Do when you know any of the brands off one of the gunner the, one of the brands i really like is gunner gunner was kind of like the first to the market i okay. think they're patent patented um there's another brand that has come out but i i've stuck with gunners i really love them. plus they're they're also like kind of sexy they're not uh, okay. stupid looking yeah, it's you know? yeah, yeah some of them are really stupid looking yeah. but um they are amber lenses and so i try not to take photos of myself on instagram <laughs> when i'm wearing them because yeah. i think they look weird but yeah. you know dave asprey no judgments yeah he doesn't mind taking pictures of himself with amber lenses but yeah. um but the gunner ones like look like cute glasses other than the fact that they're amber lenses but yeah. um and then there's another brand that just came you know, came online that is supposed to be good. And I looked at those, but I can't remember what it was. There's something about the technology behind the gunner and I don't work with them. They don't pay me. They don't even know me. Um, it's just the one that I, I, it was a discernible difference when I started using them. I remember it was, it was right around the time when I was spending more time on the computer and I would get exhausted after like an hour or two of being on the computer. And as soon as I started wearing the glasses, I remember the first time it was like, I was like this for four hours mm. and like looked up and was like, they work, they're amazing. So it really makes my time on the computer a lot more relaxed. Okay. And I don't have the kind of the physical fallout you have right. from being on your computer, right. you know? Now, do you notice one thing I noticed for sure is, is getting outside earlier in the day and exposing yourself to natural light helps with sleep for sure. Yeah, definitely. Even though it could be 12, 18 hours yeah. before we go to sleep. Absolutely. With no sunglasses on. Yep. Yep. I used to have a practice before I got a puppy. Um, <sighs> my apartment window, I'm on the second floor and it faces east where the sun comes directly in my window. Mm. And um, I used to sit there every morning for like a half an hour while I would do like my morning kind of routine and meditation. And yeah. um, I do find that I find that's helpful. And I know that the science is out there that yeah. says it's helpful. Yeah. So. What else is part of your morning routine? I really have to take that first hour to get my head on straight. So it's a lot of intention setting. I do a variety. I, I do a couple different little meditations, prayers of sorts to sort of like get my head on straight and set my intentions for the day. And if I take the first hour to do that and obviously eat and I do use caffeine in the morning, I drink green tea in the morning. If I can have that hour to really kind of like get my constitution in the right mindset, I'm great for the rest of the day. And then if I have a day where I'm not able to do that routine, it's um, challenging. And mm. so having a puppy now has kind of thrown that. Yep. So I'm reworking my morning routine. Yeah, things will never be the same. I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We're, we're reworking that. He's and It's good as long as I get him out for a walk. Yeah. He'll then give me about an hour and I can sit down and do my stuff. Yeah. You know? So the hardest thing for me is to not, I have a tendency to walk up, wake up, go to the kitchen, get food, sit down and go to work. Right. I mean, within six minutes, mm-hmm. I could go straight to work. Mm-hmm. And so those are the days that I'm the most frazzled. Okay. Those are the days that I'm most fried. And those are the days I feel more anxiety. Yeah, me too. I noticed that too. Like that would be my natural tendency. I have to force myself to do yeah. other stuff too. And same thing. I'll, so I'll be hard. super anxious and fried. Yeah. Yeah. But if I get up and I just kind of like, I think of it as like, setting the operating system for the day you mm-hmm. know it's like if i could just like get the operating system set then we're good mm-hmm. you know it's like eating breakfast i really believe if you eat the right breakfast it sets your metabolism for the day mm-hmm. and your blood sugar for the day i kind of feel that way about my brain too if i give it the right stuff in the morning then uh, it's a good day yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah you know it's funny that you mentioned that I mean, we already touched on nutrition but so many people say you know, I, I always eat a high fat breakfast and no carbs. Otherwise, I'm asleep during the day. And I, I don't feel like getting into a huge debate about it. But but that's certainly not everybody. Like yeah. so, some people have a high fat breakfast and they're ready to go to sleep. Like yeah. it, it's not a, a universal truth that when you eat carbs, you're ready for a nap. You exactly. know what I mean? Well, like yeah, I eat yeah. carbs and I feel like I run through a wall. Yeah. Well, and I, I also great. think it depends on the carbs. Yeah. And it also depends on what you're eating them with. I mean, yeah. if I eat a bowl of oatmeal in the morning, I put me to bed for two weeks, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think it depends on the nature of the carbs, but yeah. also how many and the ratio to the protein and mm-hmm. the fats, right? That's yeah. why, like, I just, I feel like keeping an eye on your macros is yeah. so helpful. I mean, it's so much. It's, it's your body type. It's how yes. much training you're doing, how yeah. lean you are. Yep. 
what your insulin sensitivity is yep. for sure. Yeah. But it's, it's definitely not universally like, eat carbs and go to sleep. Like I could eat a huge sweet potato and feel fantastic. Exactly. You know? In fact, I need to eat a huge sweet potato and feel fantastic. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and it also helps me at night to fall asleep. Yes. Yeah. You know, yeah. like it does. So I agree. I think it is so, that's the thing that's so hard. And I'm sure you get this. People will call me and be like, so what are your thoughts on yeah. X, Y, Z? Like, yeah. but I thought I was supposed to do hit X, Y, Z, right? Yeah. And it's like people just really grab right. to a philosophy as though that's the only thing, mm -hmm. right? And I'm seeing this with keto now. It's like everyone thinks everyone should be doing keto mm -hmm. and everyone thinks they're supposed to be doing keto because they said it's good. Mm -hmm. And I always say to people, what did they tell you was good about it? Yeah. Oh, I, mean, I don't certainly know. certainly benefits in this of course. right time, right place. Yeah, right And person. I don't want to say, and, I, and I'm, I don't specifically mean to use yeah. keto, like, anything, anything, right? Yeah. And I, they say, well, they say it's good. And mm. I'm like, what's what's the definition of good? What are you mm. hearing is good? Well, I don't know. They just said it's good. Yeah. And I'm like, but you got to know, you know, for every action, there's a reaction. It's like, well, it could be good and it could be problematic. Yep. So could coffee. So could kale. So could sleep. Yeah. Sleep can be good and sleep can be problematic, right? Everything. Right. Like if you've read enough about nutrition, you don't know if coffee, chocolate, beef, grains are good or bad. Like exactly. they're either the best thing ever or the worst exactly. thing ever. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like it's good or bad. Like what's your point? What's yeah. your use? What's your reason? What's your intention? What's your prescription? Why are we doing it? Right. right? And like that's kind of how I look at everything. Every single one of my clients, every program is so different because it's like, well, why are we doing that with you? Yeah. You know, what's your goal? And who are you? Mm -hmm. um, which I think is just so important as a practitioner, right? Yeah. Is it's like it's got to be personalized to you, right? As opposed to this one program works for everybody because mm -hmm. like we just know that's not true. Yep. Tell me a little bit about how you achieve balance. I mean, you said before that you you tend to work a little bit more so than yeah. maybe is healthy, which I do too. So I have to put certain things in play throughout the course of the day or a week, or I'll do the same thing. Like, how do you kind of balance that? Yeah, I don't. I don't know that I. Know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's yeah. I, I don't, and, and and you know, it's so funny. I can like, I mean, I can, I can laugh. I can laugh at the things that I know and I don't know, and it's like I'm not so sure that I have any advice on that. But okay. like, I think for me, um, I know I have to do a better job at putting the work away. Right. I know that I get depleted if I don't have some self care practices. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Um. But I'm not sure which of the ones that are most important. So I tend to go until I feel the need for some self-care. Okay. And I would like to get ahead of that a little bit. Yeah. But I also think, I mean, I'm kind of coming to this place where it's like, I just think it's a part of who I am in my DNA. Like, right. I like to work myself. Mm -hmm. I like to go to bed at the end of the day a bit depleted mm -hmm. in all ways. And so... Um, like I said, you know, yoga is a huge self-care practice for me. Yeah. Eating right. Even though it's part of our business, like if I'm eating right, if I'm hydrating, if I'm watching my caffeine and I'm doing my yoga, that all really helps me yep. to kind of do lots and lots of work without a lot of fallout. Mm -hmm. um, I used to work all the time if I wanted to. And so now I do try to preserve the weekends. Okay. So I'll usually do some work on Saturdays, but I try really hard not to do concerted work on Sundays. Gotcha. Um, and I think that keeps me going. I've also started working a little less at night. I used to work until nine o'clock at night, Yeah. turn it off, go to bed at 10. And since having a puppy, that's shifted yeah. as well. But I think yeah. doing less at night has been good for me. But I think what's cool, and it sounds like you've created a work life balance where you enjoy everything like you're not doing work that's super stressful and, and causing yeah. you anxiety like you enjoy everything you're doing yeah and it yeah. does i mean listen it does get stressful for sure. sure and i definitely do get like stressed out yeah um but it's not all day every day it's not all day every day and you know what actually i have really had to cultivate in the past year my reframing of it mm -hmm. so even if the work is stressed out the yep. reframing is wait why is this stressful i'm doing what i love i'm serving people yeah i want to do this yeah, so i've really had to it. change my language around i'm stressed out because my to-do list is so huge and i have to do this too yeah we chose it we get to do yes, it it's not exactly. we have to do it we exactly. can bail out at any time exactly yeah yeah and i had you know in my phases of depression i had this moment and this might sound real morbid and dark but like i had a day or a moment where I was like, for real, coming to Jesus. And I was like, I don't have to do this for mm -hmm. real. Yeah. Like, 
you know, Kate Spade just committed suicide. And like that really like hit deep. I was like, I get it. Yeah. You know, we have a choice. And I literally one day was like, I, I don't have to be here. I don't have to do this. But if I'm going to, I should be choosing it on a bigger, more spiritual conversation. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And so that shifted things for me. It really shifted to like, if I'm going to be here, then I got to stop bitching about it. I got to stop being so stressed about it. And, and I am deeply on a human soul level choosing Mm -hmm. this life. Mm -hmm. Right. And so let me get my mindset and my head around it a little healthier. And that really alleviated a lot for me. I mean, that shifted things a whole lot to say, I'm doing my best. I'm doing the best that I can. I'm prioritizing the important things during the day. And my to-do list is monumental. (laughs) And I got to just not stress about it, right? right. Because that doesn't do me any good. Yeah. I love it. I'm so glad we finally got to do this. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank this you. This is awesome. And I look forward to uh, spending more time together in the future. Yeah. Definitely. So tell everyone where they can find out about you, your coaching, your programs, your book, all that stuff. Yeah. Hollyperkins.com uh, is the best place to get most of my stuff. Obviously, I'm on social media, Holly Perkins on Instagram. Um, but I legitimately love hearing from people. I'm one of those people that... I tend to hop on the phone. If someone reaches out and oh, cool. asks some real questions via email, I'm like, let's hop on the phone if we can. Like, nice. I really do want to hear from people. So yeah. you can also just email me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Ali. Guys, thanks so much for listening, and we will talk to you next time. <laughs>